Today we are holding the eight meeting within the framework of the series of workshop Contemporary Area Studies, the project of school of, of the School of International Regional Studies of the Faculty of World Economy and International Affairs of HC University. Our key speaker uh, today is Dr. Tetsuya Toyoda, Director of the Institute of Asian Studies and Regional Collaboration at Akita International University. Let me thank you to be with us and accepting our invitation, uh, Dr. Uh, and our discussion will be devoted to the COVID-19 in Japan. Actually, the situation in Japan is one of the most interesting because, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Japan's, uh, Japan's outbreak remains less severe than in hard-hit European countries, but its caseload is uh, one of the Asian highest, uh, Asian highest uh, after China and India, and it's roughly on par with South Korea. There have been uh, 1,071 deaths recorded uh, so far in Japan and 10,751 cases, with the country under a month-long state of emergency, initially covering seven regions, but now in place of nationwide. But the measures do not prevent people from going out, and many shops and even restaurants remain open, uh, despite the fact that in Moscow and in other countries, uh, I mean in Russia, the situation is different. The government prohibited uh, the work of some social and, and other uh, facilities. So uh, with us today also will be Dr. Vera Vishnikova, the head of the School of International Regional Studies of the Faculty of World Economy and International Affairs of the HC University. Then Dr. Konstantin Karniev, the Senior Research Fellow, fellow at the Center for Japanese Studies at the Uni Institute of Far Eastern Studies of the Russian Academy of Science. Uh, also, Dr. Liana Strijak, Associate Professor at the School of Asian Studies and Supervisor of Academic Program Asian and African Studies of the Faculty of World Economy and International Affairs of HSC University. And also, Alicia Emilianova, Associate Professor at the Faculty of World Economy and International Affairs of the HSC University. And as I remember, Vera Vishnikova introduced one more of our expert, it's Dr. Karniev. Dr. Vishnikova, the floor is yours now, please. Thank you, Murat. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and uh, dear Dr. Uh, Tetsuya Toyoda, dear colleagues, mm -hmm. friends, and guests of our seminar, first of mm -hmm. all, I would like to thank you to each and every one of you for joining us today. Before we get started, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to Toyoda Sensei, who generously agreed to take part in our seminar to explain the real situation in Japan. And I would like to thank our experts, uh, Dr. Konstantin, Dr. Uliana, Dr. Alesia, uh, for finding the time to join us, and a special guest, Evgeny Kremnyov from Irkutsk State University. Uh, we know that coronavirus has already changed the world a lot, and now all countries are in the situation of uh, turbulence. All governments of all countries all over the world try to understand the reasons for what is happening and to find the most optimal way to overcome the economic crisis. Today we discuss the situation in Japan, the country is close to us historically and economically. We read the news about the Japan every day and know that Prime Minister Abe extended an emergency declaration from just seven urban prefectures, including Tokyo, to the whole countries till the end of April. The reason for this act is uh, the following increase in COVID-19 cases, which now total about 12,300. As experts, we are interested in the development of current situation in Japan want to know, would the emergency declaration become a reason for economic collapse in Japan? How the Japanese specialists to assess the damage of uh, canceling the Olympics? Today we try to find the answers of mm, these and lots of other questions with our guest, Dr. Toyoda. Dear Sensei, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you. I'm sure I, I hear some echo here. Yes, yes. Yes, um, um, yes can we you? can hear you. Yes, is, is this better now? Everything is okay, we can hear you, yes. Okay, I see. I see. Uh, then, um, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you so much for kindly inviting me to this very interesting event. So today I'd like to talk about the question of Japan and the COVID-19. 
but uh, I have prepared this presentation for the higher school of economics university and today is April 23rd 2020 and I'm Tetsuya Toyoda director of the Institute for Asian Studies and Regional Collaboration Akita International University and Akita International University has a student exchange agreement with HSE so every year we receive many students from Moscow and from HSE to our university. So let me start with the situations in Japan. So the situation in Japan. So just briefly, it was, yes, it was on, okay, good. I think this is better. And it was on January 16th, we had the first case. So there was a, a Japanese uh, citizen who was on the trip in Wuhan, Hubei province, and he contracted the virus uh, in Wuhan, and he developed a fever on January 3rd. And three days later, he came back to Japan, and then he was hospitalized on January 10th. And he was in the hospital from January 10th to January 15th for six days. And during his hospitalization, uh, he took the PCR test to verify whether he had contracted the coron novel coronavirus. And it was after he was discharged from the hospital, his infection of the virus was confirmed. So that was the first case. And Two weeks later, by February 1st, we have had 20 cases, and most of them were directly related to Wuhan, and no deaths so far. And it was on February 13th, we had the first death. And then by March 1st, we have had 254 cases and six deaths. And one month later, one month later, by April 1st, we have had 2,381 cases and 60 deaths. And it was on April 7th, the Japanese government declared state of emergency in seven prefectures, including Tokyo, Osaka, and others. And nine days later, April 16th, the government expanded the scope of application of the state of emergency declaration to all 47 prefectures, including Akita, by the way, asking to reduce people's contacts by 70 to 80%. And as of April 23rd, we have roughly 12,000 cases and nearly 300 deaths. So if we look at the numbers, we can see that the February 1st, we had 20. March 1st, we have a little more than 200. April 1st, more than 2,000. And we are now already 12,000. So it is quite possible we may have uh, 20,000 cases by May 1st. And you can see that we are adding one digit every month. And for the number of deaths, we had six deaths as of March 1st, 60 as of April 1st, and we have now nearly 300. So we might have 600 by May 1st. So there again, we are adding one digit every month. So we continue to develop the number of cases in this pace, in this speed, we might have 6,000 deaths by June 1st and 60,000 deaths by July 1st and perhaps 600,000 deaths by August 1st. That's what we are afraid of. So what are the problems? What are the problems in Japan in the fight against the COVID-19? So there are two major problems which are closely related to each other. The first and most fundamental 
uh, problem in Japan's fight against the novel coronavirus is that the medical system in Japan was already under heavy constraint even before the outbreak of the coronavirus. Japan is an I mean, aging country. It has a relatively large portion of elderly people. And these people have put so much pressure on the medical system in Japan. And in the same time, the Japanese government has been, especially since last year, the Japanese government has been trying to reduce the cost of medical care in Japan and trying to close some of the hospitals in the countryside. So the medical system was already under constraint even before the outbreak of the novel coronavirus. And because of the limited medical resources in Japan, the Japanese government considered in February, March, that it is unrealistic to have too many a number of PCR testings. So the polymerase chain reaction, polymerase chain reaction test, PCR test, are fundamental in identifying the, the, the cases of infection. But instead of developing PCR testings, the Japanese government has put focus on clusters, cluster tracking or cluster tra tracing. But this strategy was destined to fail, or perhaps, unfortunately, it failed. And now we have too many clusters, and we are not, we, we, can, we can no longer trace or track the, those clusters. So this is where we are. However, however, as you are quite aware, I should also point out, in spite of, in spite of apparently insufficient measures taken by the Japanese government, the number of cases has remained relatively small. So in Japan, we have 12,000 cases. So that is, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, how many cases? Yes, 12,000 cases. That is, well, a little much smaller than the number of cases in Russia. And we have nearly 300 deaths. That's again, smaller than the number of deaths in Russia. Even though in Russia, you are, implementing a very strict measures of restricting the movement of people. And in Japan, that is not the case. So how it is like in Japan? So there is no legal restrictions on movement. The, the government just asked people to reduce their movement. So let's see. Yes, it is. this is how it is like in Japan. Right? Yes, this is Shinagawa Station in Tokyo, 8 o'clock in the morning yesterday. So, the number of people has been reduced by 12% compared to the day before, and 77.7% .7 compared to usual. So, that is a drastic change. So, one-fifth of ordinary number of people in the station. But still, still you can see many, many people in the station. So, there is no legal restrictions on the movement of people. And many people are still commuting to their work. They are still going to work. And then you can, uh, well, this is Shinjuku station. And in other stations in Tokyo, at Tokyo station, we have 75% less people. Shin, at Shinjuku station, 66.4% uh, 66 less people. Shinbashi station, 76. Roppongi station, 68.5% less people. These are all in, in Tokyo. And you can also see that many people are enjoying golf in the countryside. They think it's safe to play golf as long because it is in the open air. And in other cities, well, these numbers are the comparison from the day before. 
So if you compare the number of people yesterday to the number of people the day before, uh, saprostation 5.7% less people, but in Chiba, Chiba station, we have 2.0% more people. And so, and in Kyoto station, we have 11% more people compared to the day before. So the, there is no strict restrictions of the movement of people. And of course, compared to the usual, yes. So this is a comparison uh, with the with the number of people moving around uh, in ordinary times. So in Sapporo, at Sapporo station, we have fifty-two point two percent less people. Well, Sapporo is in the no northern part of Japan, and Chiba station, that's close to Tokyo, we have fifty-six. 0.6% less. Kyoto, we have 63.6% less. Tenjin, that's Fukuoka in the western part of Japan, 59.1% less. And the Mito, that's the, in the eastern part of Japan, we have 44% less people. Gifu, that is close to Nagoya, we have 40% less. Only 40% less. Even though the situation is very serious, they, we have more than half of people compared to usual. And in Umeda, that Osaka, 74% less people. So in big cities, in large cities like Tokyo and Osaka and Kyoto, people are trying to reduce the, 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 the frequency of contacts. But in other cities, people are not getting that serious yet. So that's the situation in Japan. Well, this, is, well, this is from the TV program yesterday. And but even though the very loose restrictions on the movement of people, the situation in Japan are not that bad. And then, uh, yes, I, I think I should talk about the situations in Tokyo. So because Tokyo is the center of coronavirus infection in Japan. So many, many uh, cases are in Tokyo and they are spreading cases from Tokyo to other cities. So as of yesterday, we had uh, 3,439 cases. And you can see the case number of cases is skyrocketing like that. But, but if you look at the number of new cases, number of new cases, yesterday we have confirmed 132 new cases, but the, on April 10th, April 16th, the number of new cases reached near, nearly 20, at, I mean 200, but from that, the number of new cases is actually dropping. So, of, of course, it is still increasing, but we can see the speed of the spread of the coronavirus is, is, is a bit slower uh, well, recently. And that should be the positive effect of the declaration of state of emergency in seven prefectures on April 7th. So the picture is quite mixed. The picture is quite mixed. Even though the Japanese government has not taken effective measures, even though the capacity of the Japanese medical system was rather limited for some mysterious reason. We don't know yet why, what has worked, perhaps the BCZ vaccination or perhaps the, the Japanese, well, the, the type of virus are, are different. Or we don't know yet, but for some reasons, the Japan is saved from the most, uh, saved from the hardest hit of the novel coronavirus. And that, so in comparative perspective, the, the, the situation in Japan is relatively mild. But, but in politics, in, in politics, people uh, look at only at their own country. And as elsewhere in the world, the Japanese public opinion is angry against the Japanese government. Well, of course, the Russian government is criticized, 
by the Russian people, and the French government criticized by the French people, and the Japanese government is heavily criticized by the Japanese people. And there are three major reasons, three major reasons for which the Japanese government is criticized. Well, I mean, by the public opinion, by the popular opinion. So I think I can summarize them by these three expressions. Economy before health, politics before health, the Olympics before health. So the first point, economy before health. So Japan should have should have closed the border against China much earlier, but Japan didn't, the Japanese government didn't. Tourists from Wuhan, Hubei province, were allowed in Japan until end January. You can see that's crazy. That already in early January, we were aware that there was a very serious virus going on in Wuhan, China, but the Japanese government continued to accept tourists from Wuhan, Hubei province, until end of January for the economic interest of tourism. And the Chinese New Year holidays, Chinese New Year holidays were from January 20, starting January 24th. So the Japanese government wanted to keep those Chinese tourists in Japan. So for the economic benefits of tourism. Of course, later the Japanese government should have regretted, regretted that they have kept accepting tourists from Wuhan, but that's too late. So that's one reason why the Japanese public opinion is so angry against the Japanese government, or disappointed by the Japanese government. And then politics before health. So Japanese government put the political interest before the before public health, before the lives of people. So that is to say, people are angry that tourists from China, so other than the Hubei province, or Wuhan and Hubei province, were, of course, there were some restrictions, and the, I mean, some group tourism were, was sort of prohibited by the Chinese government, but the Japanese government put no restrictions on tourists from China until March 9th until March 9th. And people suspected, I mean, people suspect, and Japanese people suspect that it was related to the planned visit of Xi Jinping in late April. So President Xi Jinping, Chinese President Xi Jinping was expected to visit Japan in late April. And the Prime Minister Abe wanted to keep that visit as a very important political event. So he didn't, he did not want to cancel that visit. And of course the visit was eventually, finally canceled on March 5th. So after the visit was canceled on March 5th, the Japanese government declared on March 7th that there should be restrictions on Chinese tourists. So well, many people in Japan think that there is an uh, obvious link between the Abe Shinzo's Prime Minister Abe's wish to welcome Xi Jinping in Japan and the government, government's inaction against the Chinese tourists until March 9th. Finally, and this is also quite political, that's the Olympics before health. The, so the, the, the number of PCR, so I have said that it was partly, mostly because of the limitation of resources, medical resources in Japan, that the number of PCR tests was very limited. But according to the popular understanding, according to popular understanding, the number of PCR tests has been very limited, presumably, presumably, suspectedly, for the apparent downplaying of the crisis. So according to the public opinion, according to popular, popular understanding, well, this is a kind of conspiracy theory, but many people believe that. People believe that the Japanese government wanted to downplay the seriousness of the spread of the novel coronavirus so that the scheduled Olympic games can be kept. 
and I mean held in July this year. So people believe that the limited number of PCR tests is limited to the issue of the Olympics Games in July. And of course, the Olympic Games were announced to be postponed to next year on March 24th. So after that announcement made on March 24th, according to Japanese understanding, I mean, according to popular understanding, the number of PCR tests suddenly increased. So many people believe that the Abe Shinzo wanted to keep the Olympic Games, and that was the reason he didn't take it serious, the, the threat of the novel coronavirus. So these are the three major, I mean, popular criticisms against the Japanese government. Well, some of them may be true, some of them may not be true, but whether they are true or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is that people are angry against the government for these three reasons. So finally, I think this is the final slide. I'd like to well, I mean, suggest some possible consequences in Japanese economy and Japanese politics. And for Japanese economy, well, I do not yet what consequences there will be. Because of course, we don't know yet when the, the crisis will be over. It, it all depends on when the crisis be over. So if the crisis goes on months and months and years, then that would be a catastrophe. And if we will find some vaccination or some way to avoid the infection, then well, that would be very different. But one thing clear is that the networks of production of the Jap Japanese companies have developed a very dense networks of production with the Chinese companies and South Korean companies. I mean, ROK means Republic of Korea, South Korea. So Japanese industry has developed networks of production with the Chinese and the South Korean companies, but now people can't move. And that network, those networks have been seriously damaged. And after the coronavirus is over, of course they will come back, but once damaged, well, it, can, it takes long time to go back to the status ante, I mean, as they were before. So on the one hand, that the, the production industry has been damaged. And on the other hand, so because of the coronavirus, because people are staying home, we see that in some industrial sectors, in the Infomediatic sector or uh, I mean communication sector, the economy is 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 booming. So we see Netflix is booming in the U.S. or Amazon.com or Google or uh, I mean even Zoom. Zoom is making huge profits thanks to the coronavirus. So we are moving towards online economy, digital economy, but. The transition to digital economy, online economy, is not, has not been smooth in Japan. The Chinese companies and even Korean companies are ahead of Japanese companies. And the, I mean, Japanese companies, I mean, delay in adapting to, adapting themselves to online economy will have huge consequences especially in the context of the novel coronavirus. And finally, for economic policy, well, this is also issues related to international politics. Uh, I mean, skipping the third one, recovery in China will come relatively early. We, we are now quite sure. Well, we do not know yet exactly the situation in China, but the situation in China apparently are far better than the situations in Japan or in Russia. And we will see not quick recovery, but relatively early recovery of economy in China. So for Abe Shinzo, the, it is important to reestablish or uh, reconsolidate the economic ties between China and Japan. So I expect to see 
uh, some Sino-Japanese rapprochement after the economic crisis due to the coronavirus. And I'm sorry, coming back to the third point, it is very important to know that Prime Minister Abe's end of term as the LDP president, LDP, Liberal Democratic Party, that's the leading party in Japan. So he's the He's, he is the prime minister because he's the president of that leading party. And his, the end of term on the LDP president, presidency comes to end in September 2021. So, well, we still have more than one year, but Abe Shinzo is thinking about how to end his career as a prime minister. Of course, there should be some challenges. There may be some challenges to Prime Minister Abe's leadership, but so far, I think Prime Minister Abe's position is quite solid in the government and also in the party. Of course, there, are, there is a controversy over the Olympics Games. So Olympics Games are postponed just by one year, and many people say that it should be just cancelled or postponed by two years, unrealistic to have the Olympic Games next year, blah, blah, blah. But I think that Prime Minister Abe can survive these challenges, and perhaps he can come to the end of his presidency next year. Well, perhaps Prime Minister Abe feeling threatened to early his career a little earlier than expected. Prime Minister Abe is now trying to, well, that's, what I, that's what I guess, that's what I imagine. Prime Minister Abe is trying to find a way to portray himself as a great leader, as a wartime leader. So this is war against the novel coronavirus. And he's in, perhaps in search for legacies to live in history. And one idea is to have reconciliation with China. And by the way, another idea was to to con was the conclusion of the peace treaty with Russia, which has become very, very difficult recently. And perhaps he's still thinking of the possibility of the revision of the constitution or something else. And I think, again, this is this is just what I guess, but. Um, let me open this. Uh, oops, excuse me. Yes. Abe Shinzo became prime minister in December 2012, 2012, so 80 years ago. But before that, he was a prime minister. He was a young prime minister for just one year in 2006, 2007. And when he became prime minister, as a, he, he became a young prime minister, the first country he visited was China. So many people no longer remembers, no longer do not remember that. But Prime Minister Abe was a very pro-China, Sinophilic, Sinophile. Uh, prime Minister when he became Prime Minister in September, in September on September 27th, 2006. And the first country he visited was China. And in China, he issued a joint statement with, with President Hu Jintao. And there, there is one phrase very interesting. Sorry, uh, where is that? Uh, yes. Yes. So paragraph five, so this is a joint statement he made with, with the Chinese president. The Japanese side emphasized, I'm sorry, this is a bit smaller. Yes, I think now you can read it. The Japanese side emphasized that Japan more than 60 years after the war has been consistently following the path of a peaceful country and would continue to follow this path. And the most important sentence, the Chinese side positively appreciated this. So 
Dijo que iba a especial Japanese, Japanese diplomacy. You have some understanding that Abe Shinzo is a hawkish politician. He has been aggressive against China and other countries. When he was in 2006, the first thing he did was in which the Chinese side, Chinese President Hu Jintao, declared that China positively appreciated the Japan's recent history as a peace-loving country. So, Abe Shinzo, I think he is still on this track. I don't know, or no one knows. Perhaps Abe Shinzo wants to come back to that track of policy at the end of his career as prime minister. So he will try to have good relationship with China, and that will be good for Japanese economy. And that that be that will be what he will try to do. And of course, there are challenges against Prime Minister Abe's leadership, and there remains a controversy over the Olympics Games. But Abe Shinzo has been power since continuously in power since December 2012. Of course, that's much shorter uh, compared to what President Putin has achieved, but. Prime Minister Abe has enjoyed the longest term as a Prime Minister in modern Japanese history. And Prime Minister Abe, he's a I mean, political genius and he knows how to deal with the current situation. So I think that's all I have for the moment. And I'm sorry if, if there were something unclear, perhaps we can I mean, clear out some of uh, I mean, ambiguities and I'd, I'd like to know what you think of the Japanese economy and the politics, domestic and international politics. That's all. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Thank Tetsuya. you so much. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to give the floor to Dr. Konstantin Karneev. Maybe he has some comments yeah. or any speech. Please, Dr. Karneev. <clears throat> Okay, uh, thank you. Mm, uh, it was a very good report. Uh, so we found, uh, we knew a lot of new information and uh, and we can now shape some uh, situations and, and, and understand how it will be developed. Uh, in future. So first of all, I want to say that uh, Japan is one of the countries which uh, could um, uh, which could avoid the negative uh, scenario of uh, coronavirus spreading mm -hmm. and uh, maybe some Japanese experience in future it will be analyzed and adopted by different uh, by the neighbors or and all over the world because it's very positive experience, I think. Of course, it's not over still, yes, we understand it, everyone. But if we, if to compare with China, even with China or even with United States and European countries, especially European countries and United States, uh, we can see um, that Japan, in spite of its, uh, I mean, the lack of medical resources, so now uh, most, uh, of world countries uh, face the problem of uh, face the problem of me medical uh, resources. So, uh, just I want to underline that Japanese experience now is positive, and we uh, and we all um, how to say we all try to understand uh, how it happened and what will be the final result. But still, now we can. Uh, now I am I am about to say a couple of words about the uh, economical issues, and mm -hmm. we know that uh, Japan is a country which, in past, it faced a lot of economical crises, uh, starting from uh, energy crisis in the mid of seventies, and mm -hmm. then and uh, it was a very last thing crisis and. Japan uh, could um, could manage it, uh, could finally manage it only in the beginning of uh, new century. 
and uh, the, the last uh, serious crisis was uh, the result of uh, 2011 uh, nuclear Fukushima accident. Mm -hmm. It was a very strong energy crisis, but um, every time Japan, Japan could could uh, find the ways and the, and decisions um, uh, in order to um, um, to move for, for forward without uh, problems. But now, um, uh, the international monetary funds and uh, the and the forecast of international monetary funds and World Bank, they uh, underline that the decrease of world GDP will be maybe five or six percent, and uh, uh, the Japanese one maybe three or four percent, something mm -hmm. like this, and. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, tools, but one of the main tools, one of the main instruments is the po policy of uh, quantitative easing. And mm -hmm. a lot of countries now, they follow this uh, politics, but uh, Japan uh, now, the country has the biggest uh, national debt in the world, mm -hmm. uh, more than 200%. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and my, uh, and it, it seriously restrict uh, the Japanese government in the, in the tools we, uh, they can use, use to struggle the economic crisis. Because, mm -hmm. and uh, for example, Russia and some European countries, they now try to increase the national debt. They are tr uh, trying to find some money uh, on the state, uh, special state uh, obligations, yeah? Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, and uh, my question and, uh, is like this, um, which methods or tools can Japanese government use uh, in the, of course, in the financial sector, because J Japan, like an export-oriented country, it, it uh, depends on the um, international markets uh, very much. Yeah, I mean, in the decrease of uh, international markets will follow the uh, decrease of um, uh, production of different uh, high technology. Uh, uh, goods in Japan, the heavy industries and computers and so on. So, if we uh, speak about the uh, restricted possibilities of uh, quantitative easing policy, which measures are now um, in the top of discussion in Japan, how to fight, how to struggle this uh, economic uh, crisis. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Okay, my turn. Are you the sensei? Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm not an economist, so it is very difficult to <laughs> say anything meaningful. But my understanding is that what well, the IMF, of course, published their, I mean, prospect, their perspective, their report. Well, that's their job. But five percent less or three percent less, well, we don't know yet. It it all depends on when the crisis will be over. If the crisis will be over in two months, there will be not much damage. And if it continues like six months or one year, I mean, there will be 20% less, 30% less. So we don't know yet. So the about the Japanese economy as an export-dependent economy, well, the Japanese economy is now becoming perhaps less dependent on export than before. And then compared to countries like South Korea, Japan, well, the, the vehicle for economic development for the Japanese economy is more the domestic consumption than the export. Of course, its export remains very important, but it is less important for Japan for, than for countries like South Korea. And therefore, the exports, well, in order to keep Japanese economy going, I think Abe Shinzo is right. I, I don't know yet. I have not talked directly with Prime Minister Abe, but I think that's what Prime Minister Abe is thinking. It is very important to keep economic relations with China. Japanese companies are investing in China, and we are importing goods from China, and then we are inter heavily interdependent. 
And in order to recover early from the crisis, we need to reconsolidate, reinforce the economic relations with China. So that's about the maybe export policy for Japan and about the quantitative easing. And here, this is my pure guess about quantitative easing. In economic policy, in economic policy, what is most important is not to do something reasonable. The most important thing in economic policy is not to do something reasonable, but the most important thing to do something together with other countries. So suppose the situation that Japan takes a very, I mean, solid economic financial policy without quantitative easing or something, and other countries, the US, uh, European Union, China, Russia, trying to, I mean, expand quantitative easing and try to devaluate their currency, then the Japanese yen becomes ex higher and higher, more expensive, and the Japanese export will suffer. Japanese economy will suffer. So I think now many countries around the world are trying to devaluate their own currency. The US is tremendously increasing the input into the currency input in, into the market so that the value of dollars will be much less in the near future. And you can see the price of gold is soaring. That's because people know that the every country, all the industrial countries are trying to devaluate their currencies. I think the Russian government should be doing the same. So now the Japanese government is trying to do the same thing as other countries are doing. Now I think that's, when the, and well, the Japanese government has not yet developed a very sophisticated economic policy yet, because we don't know yet what should what when we will have the end of the coronavirus crisis. But about the currency policy, and I think that's where we are. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the sensei, yeah, thank and you I want you. to give the floor to uh, Alessia Emilianova. Alessia Sensei, uh, she's uh, an expert of uh, Japanese. <laughs> Sorry, here, here is Alessia. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Alicia uh, Minyanova is a, a specialist in the Japan economics and she is our colleague, uh, the professor or associated professor of the Faculty of World Economy and International Affairs. Alicia Minyanova. Yes, uh, thank you for giving me a word. And uh, thank you, Professor Toyoda, for your detailed explanation about uh, the Japanese current situation. Mm -hmm. It is really very interesting for us. So, and uh, Professor Toyoda said that uh, all people, they uh, really criticize their governments nowadays. Yes. And uh, so it is quite, on the one hand, uh, reasonable, I mean, reasonable for people. Uh, so, but uh, at the same time, uh, we realize that uh, the international situation is quite unexpected, mm -hmm. and so it was unpredictable, and uh, uh, thus uh, it is uh, quite easy to understand that uh, there would be made probably a lot of uh, mistakes on this way, on the way of going out of this crisis situation, and uh, so. And in case of Japan, I want to say that uh, I see that uh, the Japanese position is quite uh, strong facing uh, the uh, such unpredictable challenges, just mm -hmm. uh, because probably Japan is uh, one of the countries which uh, faced uh, the natural disasters much more often than others. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, it practice uh, it practice much more uh, to cope with these situations, and uh, uh, we could see that uh, even uh, the last one, probably one of the biggest ones, the nuclear disaster which happened in 2011. Uh, of course, each time when Japan faces such difficulties, such challenges. Uh, it seems that uh, the Japanese government is not probably quick enough uh, to make the uh, steps to cope with the situation, but at the same time, it uh, managed to 
accumulate uh, quite a huge uh, experience in such cases. And I think that uh, this time it can help Japan in the future uh, to go out of it probably quicker than for the rest of the world. So, and I also, from the economic point of view, I want to add that, uh, so uh, Japan really faced uh, quite, uh, so a range of crises, and uh, every time uh, we saw that uh, Japanese government, which probably opposite uh, to the rest of the world, especially to the uh, Western countries, so it used uh, state-led instruments quite a lot. And uh, usually it helped uh, to cope with the economic uh, uh, difficult situations quite in a short period of time. Uh, so and uh, I think that all this experience uh, will help again Japan to cope with the current situation in the future. And uh, we see really that uh, the international networks uh, they uh, will be destroyed, and uh, as we realize, it will be not just uh, for a couple of months, but we will face this situation and uh, we will stay with it quite for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that in this situation, the uh, uh, experience of inward looking strategy of the developing strategy of the economy can help Japan to cope with it uh, again. And uh, so it's probably the different parts, but again, facing the uh, difficult situations, the natural disasters quite often. So not only the Japanese government, but also the uh, Japanese society got used to managing with such situations. I think it will help. And uh, mm -hmm. I would like to know uh, the professors to your opinion about it. Uh, so, uh, how do you think? So, do you think that uh, this accumulated experience will be useful for Japan in the current situation and with coping the economic problems which uh, the whole world will face? Mm -hmm. and, and the second question uh, if you have an opinion about it, so uh, Japan has started the, uh, to develop the strategy as we know it, uh, Society 5.0, uh, and uh, how do you think uh, the current situation will influence uh, to the developing of the strategy? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much for very interesting two questions. So first about the Japanese experience. Well, I think the situations in Japan are less severe, less serious in, than in other countries. But I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether it was due to the quality of the Japanese society or Japanese government or Japanese people. I think it was related to some incidental elements which we don't know yet. And then the so the Japanese experiment, well, if we can learn uh, from something, I think we can learn more from the Chinese experience of strict restrictions of movement was the Australian strategy. Well, Australia has been also very successful in limiting the number of victims. Was the South Korean strategy. And well, Japan is learning from Australia and South Korea. And I do not know if Japan has anything to teach to other countries. So that is my reaction to the first question. And to the second question, Society 5.0, and yes, the Japanese government has been trying to promote a new type of society, but the Japanese society has been very reluctant to move forward. But perhaps the crisis, novel coronavirus crisis, may be an opportunity to seize, may be an opportunity to take for the Japanese government to move forward the reforms which has been, I mean, overdue since many years. So finally, Japan catch up with South Korea, China, Hong Kong, or some other countries. So I'm sorry, I tend to be optimistic. And even this crisis can be an opportunity for Japan to reform itself. So that's perhaps, that's, that's not my analysis, but that, that is my hope. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Toyota Sensei. And now I give the floor to Evgeny Kremenov, our colleague from Irkutsk State University. Yes, Evgeny Sensei, he is a specialist in China, in Chinese anthropology. Mm -hmm. Yes, if I don't uh, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Toyota Sensei. Uh, thank you for your report. It was very interesting. It was very useful for us. Uh, yes, um, my specialization is China, but still I uh, also study uh, Asia Pacific. So. Japan is very, the Japan situation is very interesting and I would like to know your opinion about uh, regionalization and uh, how the situation with the, the virus uh, um, will um, in, influence uh, this, the regionalization in the whole world and in Japan also, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we know that uh, the government of uh, different countries and in, in Japan too, uh, criticized by people. And uh, we know that the situation in different regions of different countries with virus is uh, uh, different. So mm -hmm. uh, how do you think uh, this situation could help the districts or the regions of Japan and the, uh, other countries get more freedom in uh, governance or in med managing situations with uh, uh, such big crises or uh, with viruses or even with some economics um, crises. Could it be uh, the help for uh, giving more freedom in uh, managing different regions of Japan and other countries? How do you think? Uh, so you were talking about decentralization? Uh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. That's, that is one interesting aspect of the current novel, novel, novel coronavirus crisis. So uh, as I have said, well, even though the Japanese government is doing what it can do, that the government, the central government, the, the to government in Tokyo has been very much criticized. And the local governments in Hokkaido, Osaka, or many parts of Japan have gained some popularity by doing something better than the central government. And so in the near future, there may be some political challenges from local, local politicians. And then this may be an opportunity in Japan to promote the policy of decentralization or um, I mean, delegation of financial resources from the central government to local government. Yes, there is such a possibility, but we don't know yet uh, quite clear what should happen in the, near, in, in the years to come. Nobody knows, yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. So thank you so much for your questions, dear experts, and for your lecture, Dr. Toyoda. Mm -hmm. uh, I think now it's time to move to our participants. Maybe they have some questions. Uh, as I remind you, uh, at the beginning, I said that you can use our chat to ask questions or maybe raise your hand. Uh, mm -hmm. Raise your ha hand, I'm sorry. So, and I will give you the opportunity to ask. So, if you have a question, dear colleagues, please ask. Well, so it seems to me that your lecture was so fundamental and overwhelming and there is no questions. I have a question. I'll, okay, Alexander. Yes, Alexander, raise his hand. Just a minute, I will. Sorry. We turn on the microphone and camera. Yes, and Do Alexander, you can turn your... Could and you? also Professor Dr. Mstislav Afanasyev, mm -hmm. the second mm -hmm. question will be. Alexander, now please uh, turn your, your voice, mm -hmm. your microphone. Alexander, could you turn your voice, microphone and camera? Mm -hmm. okay. So I think now we will give the From floor to Dr. Mstislav Afanasyev and after that to 
Alexander, okay? Ah, here is the question in chat. Yeah, yes. Professor Afanasyev, welcome, please. Yeah. The floor is yours. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Toyota san for your presentation. I have one short question about uh, the economic policy of uh, Japanese government. Did uh, the Japanese government present a special economic strategy during this current sanitary crisis? That's all. I'm, I'm sorry, perhaps I missed the most important part of your question. Would you please uh, repeat your question? Did Japanese government present any economic strategy during current sanitary uh, crisis? I see. Uh, so far, no. We okay. have no clear picture, no strategy. So that, again, that's one of the reasons why Prime Minister Abe is criticized. He has no strategy, he has no philosophy, he has no clear vision, he's not a leader, something like that. Uh, um, Toyota-san, and normally there are some requests for this kind of economic strategy mm -hmm. from, from the population, from the business, from the politicians. Mm -hmm. but, well, some requests still exist in, in Japan for this strategy, for this kind of strategy. Yeah, well, there are some requests, but uh, well, many people understand that we are still well, in the midst of a crisis and we don't know, we have no idea when this crisis will be over. And it is only after we have some idea how long, it's, how long it takes to finish the crisis, then we can develop some strategy for the economic recovery. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, sir. Mm. So now I move to our chat because we have two questions in chat. After that, we will return. The first question from Anna uh, and uh, she wrote, mm -hmm. I have a question regarding the second slide, if I'm not mistaken. Com uh, commenting on the slide, you compare the situation in Russia with the situation in Japan. Personally, I think that this comparison is incorrect because, uh, mm -hmm. because Russia is the second country in the number of tests done. Tests mm -hmm. done second only to the United States. Mm. As of April uh, 22nd, 2.4 million tests were done in mm. Russia, while in Japan only uh, 130.5 thousand. In mm. Tokyo population 40 million, uh, mm -hmm. 10,000 in Moscow uh, population 12.5 million. Mm -hmm. It means that uh, 580,000. You mentioned mm -hmm. the low, uh, low number of tests in the slide about criticism, but I am interested in your opinion on what is associated with a, such a low number of tests in Japan. Did Japan really manage to contain the spread of the virus so well and the number of potentially uh, infected people is actually so low or does the government have some, uh, some reasons to keep it low? Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about the Olympic Games since even uh, after the announcement of the postponement of Olympic Games, the number of tests still low as for me. Mm -hmm. So it's a question that's from Anna, please. That's, that, that's an excellent question. So first of all, I'm not saying that the Russia has more, uh, more, more cases than Japan. I think Japan has as many cases as Russia does, perhaps. But simply because of the lack of the tests, practice in Japan, we don't know yet. Well, anyway, in one week, you'll have two, twice more, three more cases. So even if the number of cases for the moment is, is half of the cases in Russia, it doesn't mean Japan has far less cases than Russia, and the number of tests are, is far less in Japan. But what I, I was saying is that, so the number of cases in Japan is comparable to the cases in Russia even though Japan has not practiced any serious measures, I mean, any strict measures against the spread of the coronavirus. And so that's then, that's the to the, the second question. So- Yes, from Paulina Grigorian. Yes, May, or you mean the second I, question? I mean, the, the second question in uh, uh, another question. Anna, another question. Is, another so the question first one is about the, yes, low number of, the, low number yeah, of tests low number in Japan. Of tests in Japan. The second, it will be 
did J Japan really manage to contain the spread of the virus right. so well? And the number of potential infected people is actually so low? Or does the government have some reason to keep it low? That's right. The, the government doesn't have any real reason to keep the number low. The only reason was that the medical budget was limited and Japanese bureaucracy was incapable of quickly adapting to the needs of the tests. So now, the, well, since, since, since two or three days, since a couple of days, the Japanese government is trying to increase the number of tests with the cooperation of the doctors' association in Japan. So that's what. So the number of PCR tests will increase tremendously in coming weeks in Japan. So the Japanese government finally acknowledges the mistake it has committed. Then this Japanese government really managed to contain the spread of virus so well. I don't think it did so well. It happened to be low. So well, it's nice to be told that Japan is doing fine, but well, I think the reality is that there was some scientific or genetic reasons, or I don't know, for some reasons out of the efforts of the Japanese government, which happened to help the Japanese government, the Japanese society. So Japan has been lucky, and in spite of the insufficiencies of the measures taken by the Japanese government, the cases of, in Japan will remain relatively low. And with just a, a slightly strict case, I mean measures taken by the government of Tokyo to reduce the number of people by 80%, 70%, 80%, well, stations are still full of people, but even with, relatively, with that relatively I mean, mild measure taken, the number of new cases is decreasing. So that's where we are. So that's the responses to Anna, 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 Anna Bali, yes. Balilulin, the question. Yeah. Yeah. Balilulin. Thank you so much, Dr. Toyota. Mm -hmm. You know, the mm -hmm. second question is so popular among ordinary people in Russia because they try to understand. Is it uh, that the how to say agreement between different governments to keep low the numbers of infected people, or it's serious because it's also lead to the second problem: how to convince people to believe that the COVID nineteen is real problem, and you should stay at home, uh, how to say, may uh, remain uh, social distance. So then I give uh, I want to read the second question by Palina Grigorenka. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Toyota, thank you for your interesting report. I have a question mm -hmm. concerning Japanese soft power. Will mm -hmm. the cancellation of the Olympics influence Japanese international image? Mm, that's a difficult question. <laughs> that's a yes. difficult question, <laughs> but well, my guess is Olympics games used to be very important. Yeah. But for older people perhaps for the people of the generation who are older than mine, perhaps Olympics were very important. And it was a tragedy that the Moscow Olympic was boycotted by the West in 1984, and the Los Angeles Olympic was boycotted by the, by the, by, by the, by the Soviets in the, and so forth. So Olympics games used to be very important, but for younger generation people, it is, it is not that important. Perhaps the, the World Cup of football may be more important than the Olympic Games. So I think the Japanese politicians are wrong to put so much energy, so much focus on, on Olympics Games. And the younger generation, not only in Japan, but also in Russia, in France, in Germany, China, elsewhere, are now less interested in Olympics Games. So I think, uh, of course, well, it sh should be, it would be nice to have Olympics game in Tokyo, but I think that it, it's, it is not worth doing that. Okay, thank you. Now the thank you very much. Yes, I have a question. Mm -hmm. If nobody has a question, maybe somebody from our participant could uh, want, to, want to ask our expert. Yes, no. it's uh, Yermolin Anastasia. She okay. I can, not only she, but there are also two people. So uh, the question from Yermolina Anastasia, dear Professor Toyota, thank you for your very interesting lecture. I want to ask your opinion on whether Japanese business businesses 
can provide help to solve the problems connected to the current problems due to coronavirus. Is there enough capacity for businesses in Japan, Japan to help government and the country in terms of, for example, logistics solutions or organizational framework? It's an interesting question. You may help the Japanese government. Uh, yes, how businesses yeah. uh, have enough uh, capability, capacity to help the government, mm -hmm. as I understand. Yeah, I think they had plenty of capacity left. So they, well now the Abe Shinzo Prime Minister Abe is trying to have more and more meetings with business people and elicit, get support from Japanese companies. And Japanese companies take this opportunity uh, as a sort of advertisement so they can make social contribution and help the government and help, help the nation. And I think uh, Japanese businesses have plenty of capacity to help the Japanese government. Okay, thank you. Now I give the floor to Vera Vladimirovna Vishnikova. Yes. She has mm -hmm. Question, please, Vera Vladimir. I'm a specialist uh, in Korea, in South mm -hmm. Korea, especially. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's why it's um, if we if we look at the situation from the point of view of South Korea, it's uh, it's an it's a very difficult situation in Japan. But if you look from the Moscow, yes, it's not so bad, because mm -hmm, the figure say, say, says this. Uh, mm -hmm. figures say, uh, say it and show us uh, this. Um, but I have maybe some political question, if you don't mind. Uh, mm -hmm. Security treaty between Japan and the USA has been always defined as a cornerstone of the relations mm -hmm. of your countries. Will mm -hmm. COVID-19 change somehow this configuration? What do you think about this? Yes. I have not established any clear opinion there, but I'm afraid it does. I'm afraid it does because the US influence in East Asia is declining especially after the coronavirus crisis. And China is presenting itself as a reliable actor in East Asia, while the US is losing its influence and authority. And the direct upshot, direct outcome of this change is that now the Chinese Navy is becoming un un restless in expanding their activities. So you have seen recently, Chinese Navy is expanding their activities in South China Sea. So what is happening in China is that the Chinese government is no longer holding the Navy in its box and the Navy is trying to expand. Well, that's what happened in Japanese army in the 1930s. And I think something similar is happening with the Chinese Navy now. So we are all aware of that. So the Japanese government and Chinese government somewhat working together to contain the Chinese Navy. I mean, that's, that's a bit too simplistic as a presentation, but the Japanese government, Japanese leaders have a very a deep understanding of political situations in China. And we, they are not afraid of the Chinese Communist Party, but they are afraid of the Chinese Navy. And in this picture, the U.S. Navy has been very important. The U.S. Navy, the seventh fleet of the U.S. Navy has been the linchpin, has been the, I mean, pressure stone in Southeast Asia. But the seventh fleet, they have developed the crisis of the coronavirus. And that's almost, I mean, caricature. caricature. That's, that's quite symbolic of yeah. the fall of the authority of the seventh fleet of the U.S. Navy. So that should affect, seriously affect the security relations in East Asia. And the most serious victim of this change is South Korea. Yeah. South Korea's security, in fact, depends on the US, but South Korea economically depends on China and its position has been always very delicate. And now, no one is no longer reliable. And well, China and Japan is are uh, sort of colluding, uh, working, helping each other. But South Korea is isolated. The relations between South Korea and China have become very sour, very difficult these months. While relations between China and Japan have been steadily, steadily in, improving. So Ch South Korea is surrounded by crazy northern brothers 
and uh, surrounded by dangerous three tigers, Russia, China, and Japan. And I think South Korea is, uh, is the one who suffers most of this crisis. And this sense of crisis is shared by South Korean public opinion. And I think that is one of the reasons why in the recent elections in South Korea, the leading party had a landslide victory because they are now living the time of crisis. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, so we are worried about the South Korea special, as a specialist. And if, if you know, as you know, the Korean proverb, when the whale struggle or fight, uh, the shrimp's back uh, are cracking or cracks. <laughs> Yes, and I think that uh, this is the same situation uh, which we can see between the USA and China and South Korean cooperation. Yes, thank you very much. And we have uh, one more question. We have a lot of questions. I'm so sorry, but questions. you know, you made me miss. Now I want to give the floor to Alexander. He finally with us. I am turn on your microphone. Dr. Alexander, okay. please ask your question. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you very much for um, the lecture, this event. Um, uh, my question is about the, uh, the Japanese style of the state emergency. I understand that like with uh, earthquakes, uh, floods, during the uh, state emergency, measures are uh, recommended measures. Can you explain uh, like stay at home, go online for businesses. Can you explain to us or to me uh, what is recommended, what is uh, voluntary, what is mandatory, what is punishable by law? Thank you. In, well, in Japan, among the measures against the coronavirus, almost nothing is punishable. There are no laws to enforce public hygiene, public sanitary measures. So the government has been just strongly recommending the companies to move to online work and encourage the people not to move, move around. So the government has been just trying to recommend people to take measures against the coronavirus. So that's a bit strange, but that's where we are. Thank you so much, Dr. Toyota. Tell me, please, do you have about maybe 15 minutes extra? Because oh, sure, have, sure, I do. Uh, we have three more questions, and I'm so sorry for, to other participants, mm -hmm. and I think it will be the last one. So, uh, maybe, yes, one, only question, yes? One question or three questions? No, only How question, you? not the comments, but the question. Yes, it's uh, only about the question. So, I would like to, uh, it's a question from ya, Yasushi. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you whether Japan, Japan also should take, uh, take stricter methods in future crisis, or it is still worth keeping these mild low systems? Mm. That's a difficult question. And well, personally, I prefer stricter measures and finish this crisis as early as possible. And myself, I have been locking myself up in this room, in this my flat, for for more than four weeks, and I'm alone in this flat, so I'm in complete complete isolation. But I'm rather exceptional in Japan. I mean, many people in Japan take this more more lightly, more less seriously. And as well as I have well. So the situations are moving on, but the recent thing is that after the emergency declaration on, on April the 7th, the situations in Tokyo are improving. The situations in Tokyo are improving. Then it will be very difficult for the government to step up the, the measures to enforce the restrictions. I think if, if the government is serious, they can ask the parliament to adopt a new law to enforce strict measures on the population, but well, we are not there yet. Well, so I you. think I, we should, but I, I expect they don't. <laughs> okay. So the second question from Yekaterina Vasonova is, uh, I have a question regarding the domestic implications of the pandemic. 
as you said, since the Abe cabinet uh, ha, uh, now is a highly criticized, have the opposition parties become more influential and is, uh, and is there any threat to the uh, LDP political leadership due to current situation? Mm -hmm. And we have many parties in opposition, but most of them are, um, are not a very, I mean, are not cons very are, are not considered very highly by the Japanese population. If there will be some, I mean, challenge to uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, leadership, it should come from within the LDP. The well, the challenge should come from within the Liberal Democratic Party. There may be, but for the moment, I mean, again, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, he's a political genius. He has survived all the difficulty, all the mistakes he has committed. And I'm so impressed how ridiculous the policies he has taken and how popular he has been so far. And he has enjoyed the longest term as the prime minister. So I think as a political genius, he will continue to serve as a prime minister until the end of his term next, I mean, September next year. So that's my prediction. Okay, thank you so much. We also have a question from Anna Valoshina. This is a similar question which I want to ask you at the end. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask about the changes in international balance of power that mm -hmm. could be expected in the aftermath of the COVID-19 outbreak. In mm -hmm. your opinion, what are the possibilities of seeing more confident and assertive China on the world stage? How might the perception of China by other powers be changed due to these events? And I want to add, how it will uh, affect on globalization, how this COVID-19 situation will affect to globalization, please. I see. So, well, again, this is just my, my personal guess. I have no proof to predict what Prime Minister Abe will do, but well, it is everyone's tendency to stick to your initial idea. So at the age of 60, I think 65 or so, he will stick to his initial idea. When he became prime minister in 2006, he wanted to establish himself as a peacemaker in East Asia and establish a close relationship between China and Japan. I think 14 years later, he's coming back to his original idea. Well, he has been trying to, I mean, improved relationship with North Korea. He has tried to conclude a peace treaty with Russia. He has made all sorts of efforts, but after all, the, all those things, finally he came back to his original idea well, by establishing China and Japan as solid partners in East Asia. I can leave, I can leave, I can, I mean, put my name in the history book. So I think that's what Prime Minister Abe is thinking. And he, he is a political genius. And when he wants to do something, I think he can do that. So thank you so much. And uh, the, the last question, I'm so sorry, it, uh, mm -hmm. it's from Maria Bratchikova. Dear Professor Toyota, do Japanese able to stay uh, at home by their own desire? Also, do they realize that it's necessary or not general opinion in society. Are Japanese afraid of the virus or they are not so concerned? I see, I see. <laughs> well, it depends, it depends. Most of the people are very afraid of the virus, but in every country, a certain number of people are not afraid of it. Well, same thing in Russia and same thing in Japan. So if the, those measures are not enforced, the, those minority of people remain outside. That's what is happening in Japan. Mm -hmm. So yes, there are a number of people who remain outside unless the government should take some strict measures. And I predict that the Japanese government will not take strict measures. Okay, thank you. Professor Toyota, yes. before to sum up, I want to ask you please, could you in one sentence explain how uh, this situation COVID, because I can't realize from your before answer, uh, how this uh, will affect to globalization? It will change, yes. or it's maybe it will be... a question. <laughs> yeah, maybe it will be the end of globalization and we will face with some new tendency in world order, in world uh, economy, maybe. What do you think about this? 
so brief, please. What is the future of globalization? <laughs> hmm. I see globalization after the COVID-19 crisis. Yeah. People will, I mean, give me one minute. Okay. <laughs> People, yeah. I mean, so to put it simple, there are two, level, two levels of people in every society. There are elites and ordinary people. And the elites, they are fluent in English, they, are, they travel abroad and they enjoy international things and they take benefits from the globalization. And they are the promoters and the college educates. They are the promoters of the globalization and the globalism. But there is a large portion of society who, are, who think globalization is against their interests. And the COVID-19 finally made the elite, finally made the upper class of people realize that the anti-globalization sentiment has some good reasons. So after the coronavirus crisis, the understanding from the political leaders or business leaders, political leaders will develop about the negative sentiment towards the globalization, then we can better handle, I mean, deal with the globalization, which is necessary in any way. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm personally, I'm, I'm very optimistic. So I tended to come back, come down to something very optimistic and perspective. Okay, it's good to hear. And uh, now I think it's time to sum up. First of all, let me thank you for your overwhelming speech. It was really great and so amazing. And we hope the situation, we all will overcome the situation as soon as possible. So, and I uh, want to really say thank you for your, for your time, for uh, coming with, and talking with us. Uh, thank you to our dear colleagues, to Professor Yemelianova, to Professor Korneyev, to Professor Struzak, and to Professor Kremnyov and to Dr. Vera Vishnikov for interesting question and to yes, our participants. To all, all of our colleagues and guests. Yes. Yes. Uh, I just <laughs> want to. Yes. Yeah, okay. Please. Please. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just want to say that uh, wish you all take care about your health. Uh, be careful. Stay at home as possible. I know that it's sometimes it made, uh, it uh, make us mad but we try to do it so wish you all the best and see you soon uh, actually at 28th of april we will uh, talk with our dear experts expert from uh, india dr samir mm -hmm. sarab he will talk about the international effect uh, as about effect of covid-19 to world order international relations Thank you so much one more time. Thank you, Kayoda Sensei, for your really interesting yes report. And uh, I think that uh, the best uh, thing that uh, there are a lot of, there were a lot of questions today. Yes, uh, the best result is the questions of our That's colleagues, right. of our students. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, I I was very happy to hear you from hear us in our virtual yes virtual conference, and I hope mm -hmm. that. It will be the opportunity to meet you in Moscow, maybe in years future. Yes. Okay. And uh, stay at home, uh, stay at home, everybody, and be careful <laughs> in our <laughs> situation. So, bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.